not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, it's LiveGate Outreach TV, all one word. Please make sure you are subscribed. And whatever you do, get the podcasts. It's LiveGate Outreach Center on audio podcasts on all platforms you can find them. If you are used to Spotify, you are used to Audible, you are used to Amazon Music, all those podcasts, we are there. LiveGate Outreach Center, just look for us and you will find our Sunday messages every week. And uh, to the glory of God, we have had um, active participation in those platforms for about six years now, since 2017. And we want to thank God, and thank God particularly for the vessel he is using to help us in that regards. And uh, God will continue to bless you as you make use of those resources in Jesus' name. We have been on a series on divine exploits by resurrection power. Uh, again, this is something that I must keep emphasizing in this church. We run series every time. When we finish one series, we start another one because it helps us to have a structured and focused approach to studying the Word of God in a logical, sensible way that allows us to build knowledge in, according to themes and according to the various things we like to export, uh, ex, uh, that we like to explore about Scripture. The Word of God is vast. The Word of God is deep. The word of God is past finding out. The truth of the matter is that the more you unravel the word of God by the Holy Spirit, the more it exposes to you things that you never thought of before. Um, and I want to appreciate God for helping us to do this as a people. So our theme, as I said, the, the series is Divine Exploits by Resurrection Power, but this is session four of five. We'll be finishing this series next week. If you haven't got the series, make sure you go again to LiveGate Outreach TV. You will find the five parts right there. Uh, the, the five parts will be there by next Sunday, but we have three parts there already, where, which we have looked at the, the dying to live as the first one, and then we have also looked at resurrected for exploits as the second one, and, uh, which, was, we, which we looked at on Easter Sunday. And uh, we last Sunday started what I call the power sub series of the series, the power sub series, because we are looking at power that is out of resurrection, divine, uh, out of resurrection power that God has given to us in the spirit, in the soul, and in the body. The three realms of man that man should function. And so get last Sunday's message as an introduction to power for spiritual exploits. We have said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 to verse 24, that God wants man to be sanctified through and through, spirit, soul, and body. We have been reading that very well. Today, I will quote a lot of scriptures that we may not project because of time, but I would urge you to please write them down. You see, one of the things that is lacking in our generation, why we don't have as much depth as we used to have, I must say, and when, when we were teenagers, the saints we met, were very, they were very keen to know the scriptures. They learned, they taught us how to learn scriptures. They taught us how to know scriptures. You see, the word of God is the basis of the faith that we carry. The more the word you know, the more you are able to appropriate, the more you are able to stand strong, and the wishy-washiness of this time, the confusing things will not be as potent in your life and in the life of your children because they will be asking questions. And if you don't know the word of God for yourself, what will you explain? What will you say? You know, don't speak frustratingly to, to them. You need to be able to explain. There's a funny story of a man, of a woman who uh, had some uh, divergent opinion with her husband. Her husband believed that uh, we came from animals in terms of... Uh, evolution. And she, of course, does not believe that as a Christian, she felt she knows that we came as God created us right from the time of Adam, which I'm sure everybody in this place will believe, unless uh, you want to um, contradict my opinion on that. But the truth is, a little boy, a little girl of three years old came to her mom and said, mom, I'm really confused. Dad said we came from animals as a family, that we all came from animals. And you said that we came from God. That what, what is the difference? So the woman didn't know what to say to the child. He said, you see, what happened is that your father told you about his own family. <laughs> As for me, my family, <laughs> that will confuse the child some more. <laughs> 
rather than just rationalizing it that and trivializing it like that, let's, let's be able to explain to those innocent young souls to know what the, the true answers should be. So we are going to be looking at the power. So you can see there, God wants us to be sanctified completely, spirit, soul, and body. And we have established this so many times in the last few weeks. Say, God has sanctified me in my spirit. He has sanctified my soul. And he has sanctified my body. So those, that, like I said, the process is once. Once you become born again, you are totally sanctified. But your access to the full sanctification is tied to your knowledge. You can only experience the provision that you know about. How many of you have been on a trip? Thank you for the scripture. How many of you have been on a trip when you, 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 you paid for a holiday and uh, they said to you, they put some things and you read it and you thought you've understood it. And then when you get there, you are following what they said. And then on the last day, after five days or six days in the hotel, then you say you want to buy something and they say, but you don't need to pay for it. <laughs> that is part of what you have been given or you, you paid for originally. You know how you feel. You feel like you have cheated yourself many times over. Because you, it's, it's not yours for five days, six days. But because you did not know. So I always ask questions. When I read and read and read and I don't understand, when I get there, I ask questions. <laughs> We went to Dubai, I think it was November 21. Lovely, lovely holiday package came through, paid for it. Then they said it was half board. I said, ah, half board, is that bed and breakfast plus lunch or bed and breakfast? I know half board means it's not all the food or some of the food. So is it morning and evening or morning and afternoon? Because I want to know which one so I don't miss anyone there. <laughs> and I had a team of about seven people, so I didn't want to waste that money. So, you know, when I got there, it was the first thing I asked. As we finished checking it, he said, is that okay, Mr. Loki? I said, it's not fully okay. What is this half board? When are we supposed to eat? And um, it helps a lot to find out. So, this is how believers must explore the words of Scripture. He knows his thoughts towards us. They are of good and not of evil to give us a future and a hope. What does that mean? To bring you to an expected end. What does that mean on a day-to-day -day basis? You have to dig into the scripture some more to understand what that means for you as a person, what it means for you as a man, what it means for you as a woman, what it means for you as a husband, what it means for you as a wife, what it means for you as a father, what it means for you as a mother, what it means for you as an employee, what it means for you as an employer, what it means for you as a friend. You have to keep digging and digging, digging, because that future and a hope has meaning that encompasses everything, spirit, soul, and body. So this is why we can't afford to be lazy. We can't afford not to keep stretching and digging into the word of God. This is why in this church, on a Sunday to Sunday, we do everything we can. And then in the course of the week, we unravel as much as we can on a particular topic so that we can continue to grow in this knowledge. The sanctification of the spirit, like we heard last week, gives us access to eternal life, to be witnesses for God. Basically, that's what it does. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. And then he told us in that verse, 2 Corinthians 5, he told us there that we are now ambassadors for Christ. And he has reconciled us and has given us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. So we are called to be witnesses. So we are spiritually sanctified to carry the power of the Holy Spirit to witness of the goodness of God in sending his son to mankind. That's primarily what it is. Every other thing in terms of signs and wonders are to follow us in casting out demons, praying for the sick, helping people to come to the knowledge of God should just be to help us support that message. So we don't chase signs. Signs should chase us. And this is what is very important. So we did all that last week. You can look at that in session three in Power for Spiritual Exploits. Then what we'll be doing next week is what I call the sanctification of, body, of the body or power for physical exploits. I won't talk too much about it because we're dedicating the whole of next week to that from Sunday. But you see, today we're looking at the sanctification of the soul and we, 
We'll just look at an aspect of it because it is not possible to cover everything in this one session. The sanctification of the soul leads us to continuous transformation of our will, our emotions, and our intellect. Okay? The soul of man is where his willpower, his emotional strength, and his intellectual prowess lies. So the soul of man in the natural form, as a man is born naturally, has capacity to will. That's why you decide. Without knowing God or knowing that God exists, even from childhood, you decide. Have you ever given your child some food and you give them the vegetable? And a, a six-month-old, or let me say, nine-month-old baby will look at you and say, uh -uh. have you ever seen that happen? And you are wondering that this little human being is already exercising their power to choose. But when you give them the chocolate or the sweet thing that they like, they say, ha, because they like that. And they show you what they like and what they don't like from an early age because it is innate in man to be able to exercise their will. They cry because they are, we are beings of emotion. We have emotional capacity to cry and smile. Children start smiling. Some children start smiling from minute five when they are born. You see them flash those smiles. They don't know what they are doing, but they flash those smiles until the time when they can smile by themselves. And they cry and they do those things. And all this can go on in life because it is innate in man to exercise the willpower. The same thing with the intellect. We can start to learn naturally. We can start to know those things. So my point is when we are sanctified, what separates us and distinguishes us as children of God is now the capacity of, the, to, of, of submitting those things to the Holy Spirit. So your willpower no longer links to the flesh, no longer links to just what you want, but it links much more to what God wants for you. How many people understand what I'm talking about? Praise the Lord. So your willpower, your emotions, no longer just react to circumstances around you, but rather the power of God that is at work in you. Jesus said, my peace, I live with you. John 14, 27, my peace, I live with you. Not the type that the world gives so that your peace is the peace that you have is inside you and is at work in you always. So every one of us must understand. So today we are not going to so much concentrate on the willpower and emotional power of man, but I want us to look at the intellect, something we hardly talk about in the body of Christ and is becoming more evident that for us to truly manifest the way God wants us to manifest, we must know how to engage God with the power of the Holy Spirit to stimulate our intellect. Let's help the children. The Bible says, Jesus speaking last week, he says the spirit of the Lord, if I go back very quickly to spiritual exploits, he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And we said that is the manifestation of the spirit of the Lord. Remember the sevenfold manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, number two, and then the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of counsel are the six, and then the seventh one is the spirit of might. The spirit of might. We will be looking at the spirit of might next week. Those sevenfold manifestations are things you, when you pray, Holy Spirit, help me. Know which aspect of the Holy Spirit you are actually asking for help. You have been taught that the Holy Spirit comes upon you and it gives you power to do. But you see, there is an element of the Holy Spirit you can entreat. And with knowledge and understanding, you can walk in it very, care, very, very carefully, conscientiously to deliver its true power. Now, the Holy Spirit is one. We are not saying that there are seven Holy Spirits, just like the Trinity is one. This is what the world cannot comprehend. They say, how can you preach three gods? We don't preach three gods. We preach one God who expresses in three ways. He's God the Father, he's God the Son, and he's God the Holy Spirit. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Deuteronomy 4.4. 4. He is one God. So we know that he is one God, but we also understand that he is the Father, he is the Son, and the Son is also the Word of God, and then he is also the Spirit, who is the empowerment we get as we understand more the Word of God. So the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us. The spirit of the fear of the Lord helps us in our willpower. When the spirit of the fear of the Lord is at work in a person, it helps the person to will according to God's will. So the spirit of the fear of the Lord helps us. 
The Spirit of the Lord also helps us in terms of how we have our emotions and the fruit of the Spirit, to enjoy the fruit of the Spirit. It's by the Spirit of the Lord. So we enjoy love, we enjoy joy, peace. We are able to be long-suffering because the Spirit of the Lord is upon us and is helping us to be able to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. But you see, when it comes to the Spirit of the Lord that works in our intellect, it is the four out of them. This is why I said it is so important to understand. So for your intellect to be stimulated by the Spirit of God, you must know the workings of, say with me, the spirit of knowledge. Say the spirit of understanding. Say the spirit of wisdom. And the spirit of counsel. So make sure you understand that. Those things, those, those manifestations of the spirit of the Lord work on us. That is why we are able to generate intellectual exploits. I define intellectual exploits as godly manifestations that are born out of reasoning and understanding objectively. Godly manifestations born out of reasoning and understanding objectively, especially with regard to abstract matters, especially with regard to abstract matters through a regenerated mind. I know it's a bit long-winded, but I was trying to put words to it. I'll read it for you again, don't worry. I know you couldn't have written all that down. Intellectual exploits refer to godly manifestations born out of reasoning and understanding objectively. Reasoning and understanding objectively. Especially with regard to abstract matters or complex matters. Abstract matters, things that are not easy to decipher. Especially with regard to abstract matters through a regenerated mind. Only a regenerated mind can manifest divine intellectual exploits. An unregenerated mind will stay in the realm of the natural. This is why a believer must understand the difference. And I, like I've said, since we started this year, that exploits can be performed by human beings who don't even know God at all. But there are divine exploits that are the exclusive preserve of those who relate with God. The Bible says those who do know their God they shall be what? Strong and do exploits. Those kind of exploits that Daniel is talking about is not the kind of exploits that ordinary people can do. So, but if believers do not understand this, even the little basic exploits that we should all perform with natural senses, we cannot even attain it. Not to talk of now tapping into the realm of the supernatural exploits. And so I want us all to understand that the intellect gives us access to the spiritual, uh, the sanctification of our intellect is what gives us access to the spirit of knowledge, wisdom, understanding, and counsel. When the children of God had the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, Jesus had told them in 1.8 that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon them. Okay? Another scripture we quoted last week very well. But if you look at what began to happen after Peter's message in Acts 2 and 3,000 people were saved, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5 shows you, you see, when, when, when the Bible says you shall receive power, that power is for spirit, soul, and body. A lot of the time, the church concentrates on the spiritual element. So we pray for people, we say baptism of the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues, and then you, you manifest, and you start to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, and understand those things, which is all fine and correct, but it is limiting what it truly is. It is also the Spirit that gives us emotional stability. It is also the Spirit, that same power that gives us the ability to have the willingness to do the things of God. It is also that one which stimulates our intellect. And that is my emphasis today. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming on a person of the work of the Holy Spirit to help their intellect to be stimulated is what we are talking about today. And I want you to please follow me because there's a lot of things in what I'll be sharing that you will need to know. If you look at them in Acts chapter 3, 4, 5, right up to verse, chapter 6, verse 6, as the church was growing, you can see some intellectualism that they started to explore. They started to set up structures, especially for the welfare system. 
Here was just 120 people overnight becoming 3,000 plus people and gathering together in houses. They didn't have halls that they can meet at 10,000, 5,000 people at a time. So they gathered in people's houses and there was the wisdom without technology to connect everybody together in that same spirit of the one message. Think about it very well. There is the power aspect of it, but there is the intellect, there is the spiritual aspect of it, but there is the intellectual aspect of organization that went to, that also took place. You see, many of us read those things and we don't really look at how much, how a man like Stephen would recite the whole of the Old Testament without opening one scroll and give factual figures as to when Abraham, his age, and how he moved, how he was called out of Mesopotamia, and how he went to, to seek the place, how he came out of Haran and went to seek the place, and how the, his people went back to Egypt, and all those things. And he was able to recite them without any prompts. That is the stimulated intellect. I was listening to the Nigerian vice president, uh, uh, outgoing as it is now, Vice President, on a speech. He's a very fine speech giver. One of the best, I would say, in Africa, if not the world. Very, very clever man. Very clever. Yes, let's clap for Jesus Christ. I know you may not like his party. I don't like his party as well, but that's a separate matter. <laughs> but the truth is, I believe he's one of the finest minds that we have. But you know he's a pastor. He's a child of God. And it shows in his disposition and you can, feel the, you can feel the love of God welling from the inside of a human being. That's, that's just reading a political speech. It's not preaching. A mind can be touched by the power of God. Touching and stimulating the intellect. How these men went from place to place. How did Saul get born again in Acts chapter 9? Then three years later, in Acts chapter 13, begins to teach people how the word of God is structured, how grace is to work, how faith is to connect with grace for salvation, how people should no longer hold on to tradition, and started breaking down those things in three years. Somebody says stimulated intellect. From today, I want you to read your Bible in two ways. Read the Bible to understand and pray that the Holy Spirit should show you the depth of what it contains. Because the two things help you to get yourself to also appreciate what God is doing in your life. And to take you to where God wants to take you to. From Acts chapter 13 to Acts chapter 27, we read of the many, many things that Paul did. Facing people like Felix. Facing governors and breaking down the word of God to them in diverse ways. But that's not our emphasis today, as you all know. We are looking at the life of a man called Joseph, who lived about 4,000 years even before the book of Acts. Joseph's story is one that is very relatable in many ways. Joseph was a nobody. Joseph was a slave. Joseph in Egypt was a slave. In his family back in Canaan, yes, he was somebody that was loved by his father and all that, but we know his story, how he was sold into slavery and he found himself like any base man. And that's why I said it's relatable. I always believe that if Joseph can, if God can take Joseph to the pinnacle of governance and influence in a foreign land, no immigrant anywhere should be complaining. This is my belief. And don't say, ah, Brother Dave, that's very harsh. I'm not being harsh. Did you read your Bible? Was Joseph an Egyptian? Please answer me, church. Was Joseph an Egyptian? No. no. Was he not a slave? No. Absolutely. So it was, it was even worse than many immigrants, as it were, in the land that they've been. I've been privileged to be an immigrant all my life. In fact, even when I was in my country, I was like an immigrant. I was born in northern Nigeria. People who were born my time, we were born after the Civil War, Nigerian Civil War in the late 60s. I was born just when the war was about to finish. So those of us growing up then, we were, if you are not from that region, you are always seen like somebody who was, because the, 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 the war is not good. People who just say war, war, they don't know what it is. It changes everything forever. Up to today, the country is still reeling from that war in, in many ways. So when we were growing up, it was evident that we were not, we were, those of us from the southern part of the country, 
we were always like a threat to the northerners. And some of our fathers were doing very well in civil service, top lecturers like my father and people who were leading science teachers and doing a lot of conferences and things. So they, we were always seen like threats to take over the economy of the people of the land. And we were just trying to live life. Until today, I'm still seen like a threat even in this country. <laughs> Anywhere you are an immigrant and God is helping you, you will always remain a threat. Forget about the fact of the fact that we know that we should live in harmony, we should live peacefully. Don't let anything deceive you. It is a natural part of a human being to see anyone coming from somewhere else as a threat. So don't be intimidated by those things. When I went to the United States, I was the only black child in a school of 300 white kids as a 9-year-old, 10-year-old. So you want to tell me about immigration? You want to tell me about being feel left out? I can tell you stories. So Joseph did not have any, he had many reasons to be complaining about his parents, uh, his, his brother, sorry. He had many reasons to be complaining about Potiphar's house, especially Potiphar's wife who lied against him so terribly and put him in prison. He had many reasons to confine himself to that life that was lowly and was not going to go far. But he held on to his God. He held on to his God. And as he held on to his God, the spirit of God walked in him, stimulating his intellectual prowess to the point whereby God was able to take him to the highest throne that God has already said his life was going to be. That is why I say to you, when you read the scripture that says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, they are of good and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope or an expected end. Look at Joseph's story. Think about it. He had a dream as a 17-year-old, 16-year-old, had a dream. Everybody despised his dream, including his father. And his brothers hated him for his dream and sold him to slavery. But here was God working out things, line upon line, precept upon precept. That is why you and I must understand that as long as we fear God and are walking in his will and purposes, all things are working together for what? For good. But how did Joseph demonstrate this to us? And that's what we're going to learn in this session today. We'll go back to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41, we have read that very much in the Bible reading. If you are uh, just joining us or you didn't know about that, it was Genesis 41 verse 14 to verse 45 that we read. I'll be picking a few verses uh, from the earlier part from, from verse 14 to 16 and then I'll jump to other places. Joseph ex exemplified intellectual exploits through the Holy Spirit. He exemplified intellectual exploits through the Holy Spirit, and we can learn from his life. Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. The Bible says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. They brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Verse 15. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream. And there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. I'm reading Genesis chapter 41, verse 16. Now say with me. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Can you see his secret? He said, it is not in me. We first know that God, Joseph, unlike Daniel, we didn't read much about Joseph praying and confronting the authorities with his prayer. Daniel was clear. He, you know, we saw that one very, he open window and pray. <laughs> and they threw him in the lion's den. You know his own story? Very similar kind of to Joseph because they, they two were slaves. But Joseph was not so much, we didn't see, hear that so much, except some of his phraseologies. When he refused to sin with Potiphar's wife, she said to her, he said to her, my, fa my, my master has put everything in my care except you. And then he said, how can I do this wicked thing and sin against God? Against God. That was when we first saw clearly how God-fearing Joseph was. And then when Pharaoh called him, this time when Pharaoh called him, Pharaoh had become frustrated. He had two dreams, like you saw in the story and many of you know, of things that were looking bizarre. Lean cows swallowing fat cows. Lean ears of corn, thin ears of corn swallowing good-looking ears of corn. 
And there were seven, seven cows, seven stalks. And so he was confused. He said, what's this kind of thing? So he called his magicians, and the magicians did everything they could to try to make it happen to decipher, but they could not do it. And so he was a frustrated man. You see, before this time, the magicians would do anything. Remember, they trust, the pharaohs trusted their magicians so much because they had powers from their demonic realms that they used. But those powers were always shown to be subject to God's power every time. Just like they could not decipher this dream when Pharaoh, when Pharaoh now had to call for Joseph. The same thing when they were to be liberated, the children of Israel were to be liberated 430 years later. Remember the snakes that they, they performed with their rods? And Moses also came and performed his own, threw down his own rod. And what happened? His own rod did what? Swallowed up all the others. For God to reinforce the fact that there are powers that be, but there is no power that be unless it is ordained of God. And God's power will always remain supreme. So never be afraid. When you, when people say, oh, this witchcraft, oh, this demonic power. You see, we give too much credence to the devil without understanding the power of the powers. I say we don't understand the power of the powers. The God of all gods, the God of all flesh, the Lord of all lords, the King of all kings. If you have him on your inside, you have no business being afraid of any witch. I do not deny the power, the, the operations of witches. They existed. I mean, they exist. Not that they existed. <laughs> Very soon they will be, they existed. But they exist. They exist. But a believer must know what they have. When this church started, it was a battle. I fasted with my wife for six months because we could see that if we don't fast, if we don't pray, this church will not get off the ground. So between January 2013, I went to Nigeria. I told my friend, I'm trusting God he will be with us for the anniversary this year by the grace of God. You have heard about him so much, Pastor Hendrix Echoga. And I went to do a business in Nigeria, actually, but I called him. I will be in Abuja for some time, and I just need one day to go to the site and come back, and I want to relax. He said, Brother Dave, I'd like us to take some time to pray for your church, because I shared with him what God was doing and when we'll launch the church later on in the year. So for that one week, we did not eat till evening every day. He will come. He's a very busy person. He will come, drive to the hotel, and we will pray, and we will pray. Then one of those prayers in the middle of the week, he said to me, Brother Dave, I can see this church is going to start with a bang. I said, what does that mean? He said, I can see many people. He said, but all the people you see that at that point, thank God for them. He said, but they will not be the people who will do the work with you ultimately. I said, which kind of church are you telling me about? <laughs> Every pastor wants people to come and start to work. What are you talking? He said, he said, it's nothing to worry about. He said, it's nothing to worry about. He said, I could see a large crowd. The day we dedicated this place, there were 200 plus people here. Because we have 200 chairs here, there were no chairs left. So I knew there were more than 200 people in here. We have the photos. You'll see them at the anniversary, by the grace of God. The first service the next day, we were just 48 people. And I said, praise God. God said to me, whoever you see, 8 or 80, he said, they are the ones I've brought to you. That God told me that early September 1, 2013, it was a Sunday morning. He said, they are the ones I've brought with you to do the work with you. And I said, praise God. So when I came in and there were 40-something people, I said, praise God, let's get on with it. And I ordained all of them as church workers. <laughs> praise the Lord. I think that's the last ordination we have had so far. As it were. <laughs> Everybody became deacon and deaconess, so it started confusing everybody. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I said, let's get on with the work. Let's get on with the work. But you see, a time came. This was about six months into, this, into the church. A time came, I would be standing here to preach. And I'll feel a physical force holding me down in this place on this altar. Now, how many of you have ever experienced something where when you sleep, you want to move your hand, it, it won't move. You know that kind of thing. I don't know what they call it. You want to say Jesus, even your mouth will be struggling to open. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm sure doctors will tell us it's a medical condition. It's witches. <laughs> There is no medical, it's which is which witchcraft. <laughs> Doctors will call it uh, paragialia. <laughs> Paralysis paragialia. <laughs> yes, yeah, nothing like that. It's witches, <laughs> flying witches. <laughs> flying witches. Ah, I went to bed, it's sound, healthy. I've just eaten. And then suddenly I can't raise my hand. They say it's condition. No, it's witch. <laughs> it's witch. <laughs> 
But honestly, I felt that standing here to try and preach, the first day I thought I was tired. And I said, Lord, give me strength. I went through it. Ah, the next Sunday again, I stood up. I said, Lord, uh, we, let, let's start the message and things. And I started feeling the same thing. Nobody knew in the congregation, but I was struggling to talk. I was struggling to stand. I called all the pastors here then. I said, we have war. They said, what? I said, there's witch in this church. <laughs> I said, there's witchcraft here. They said, ah, how do you mean? I said, ah, I am the one feeling what I'm feeling. <laughs> We came here one Saturday, one Friday night and prayed, prayed like that till morning. That was the last of it we saw. Some people left the church after that. I'm not calling them witches, but that's what happened. But the reality is that that was a clear experience that there are witch and demonic activities. But I have also found that if you can let God stimulate your intellect, you can always overcome them and shine like Joseph. I say you will shine like Joseph in the mighty name of Jesus. The world defines intellectualism in two ways. They say that there is a principle called rationalism. Rationalism. They say that this rationalism means that you can use logical senses to gain understanding and then to reason. You use your logical reasoning to just come to a reason and then you can give an outcome. That's one school of thought. I'm just telling you natural things that psychologists define as intellectualism. Then there is a principle which is completely contrary called anti-intellectualism. They claim that this one does not regard reasoning, but it just works by your feelings. It works by your intuition, what they will call a gut feeling. Have you ever heard somebody say, I just walk by my gut feeling? And some people live like that. They just go by whatever comes to them. Now, we should understand as well that when the Holy Spirit prompts us, that's what it looks like, but it's a different thing. A gut feeling is like a guess. It's like something that is strong, but is a guess. The Holy Spirit will come into you when he wants to inspire you to, for something like that. It's gentle. It's assuring. It's confident. You, you, you feel confidence in it. It's comforting as well. It does everything that your sense knowledge could not do. So anti-intellectualism says that you can just operate by feelings, you can operate by intuition, or you can just simply operate by your spontaneous action. But you see, all those things are man's devices trying to understand what this intellectualism is all about. Joseph came and showed us when he said, it is not in me, it is not in me, but it is God that gives answer. He came and showed us that the power of God is able to bring answers that human reasoning cannot comprehend. And I pray that as we study his life today, seeing how the spirit of knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and counsel worked in him, God will open our eyes to see the same in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Very quickly, we jump to verse 28. Genesis 41, verse 28. The Bible says, I'll read it to verse 30. The Bible says, this thing, I'll first talk about the spirit of knowledge. The spirit of knowledge. Go to verse 28. Thank you. Verse 28 to verse 30. Let's first look at the spirit of knowledge at work in Joseph. Genesis 41, verse 28. 28. Thank you. He said, this is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. Somebody say, this is the thing. Say, so God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Somebody say knowledge. knowledge. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So Joseph, by the spirit of knowledge, knew that that dream was God speaking to Pharaoh. Okay? He said in verse 29, Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them, seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. Seven years. He said, and this thing is what I have spoken to Pharaoh. This means he knew what God was saying to Pharaoh. The spirit of knowledge gives assurance and it helps you to know what is appropriate for every situation. You see, Pharaoh represents those things like the authorities, 
They represent our customers, those of us in business. They represent management, those of us in the workplace. They represent those people who have a say or the other in how we fulfill God's progress of promotion for our lives. That's what a Pharaoh represents. His dreams represent their problems, their challenges. Pharaohs also represent unbelievers because unbelievers also need something from us. They need our testimony. They need our witness. So every unbeliever is like a pharaoh. They may not act it. They may not ask, but that is the truth. They are also searching for the truth. Everyone you see rebutting the faith and not accepting the faith and looking for other things is saying clearly, I want the truth. Even though they may have rebuffed the faith. But ultimately, when the wisdom of God comes on us and the spirit of knowledge helps us to relate with them, we see where their questions are and we are able to relate with them in solution to those questions. Do you understand what I'm saying? In your workplace, everything that stands between you and the next promotion or the promotions that God may want for you there or in your career progress is a pharaoh. It's a type of a pharaoh with a dream. That dream is the problem that needs to be solved. Believers can pray and fast, but believers don't understand this simple secret. The more problems you can solve, the higher you go. Very simple. The more problems, especially complex problems, you can solve by the Spirit of God like this. If you remain at the realm that everybody using physical, intellectual capacity is solving problems, you will be at that level like all the magicians. And Pharaoh and uh, Joseph knew that he must not stay at that level. So when they said, we heard that you have this power to do, he said, it is not in me. He quickly called on the power that makes people excel. So our knowledge of God must help us to manifest the mind of Christ. I've quoted Daniel 11.32 before. He said, when we know our God, we shall be strong and we shall do exploits. But 1 Corinthians, please, very quickly, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. We'll come back to Genesis 41. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. He said, for who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Say with me, I have the mind of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 16. I have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. Why do we not have the knowledge of Christ? We don't engage the spirit of knowledge that came on him. Remember, Isaiah 11, 2 talks about that spirit coming on him, the root of Jesse, and the him that was to represent that the, storm, the, the rod out of the house of Jesse, that it is, will be the spirit of knowledge, wisdom, understanding that will be at work in him. Everyone must come to the place where we are engaging our mind, the mind of Christ, on a continual basis. You see, the mind of Christ is a mind of humility. Philippians chapter 2 tells us this. He said, let, let this mind, Philippians 2, 5, he says, let this mind be in you, which also was in where? Christ Jesus. Even though he was God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation and he humbled himself. He humbled himself. You want to have access to the spirit of knowledge consistently? Be a person that works in intentional humility consistently. Joseph said, it is not in me. He had interpreted two dreams that came to pass. Our generation will say, yeah, actually, last year, you know, I told the baker that he was going to die, and he died. <laughs> and I told the butler he'll be back, and he's back now. You see, I'm, it's just one of those gifts I have. No, 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 because we are told to sell ourselves. And I believe that. I preach it. But know what you are selling. Yeah? Sell yourself, but know what you are selling. Don't sell yourself without God. If you sell yourself without God, you will fall flat. Sell yourself with God. He said, it is not in me. He said, there is a God who will, answer the, who will answer the dreams of Pharaoh. And God opened his mind to him. He said, that dream that you have had is God telling you what was going to happen. So the spirit of knowledge is something that must work on, in us and through us if we want to manifest spiritual, intellectual capacity. Friends, we need to know. We need to know. Knowledge can be stimulated by 
our reading. Knowledge can be stimulated as we observe. Knowledge can be stimulated as we are taught. All that is fine. But the knowledge that brings the manifestation from above is the one the Holy Spirit broods over. You must read. You must do those things that you should do physically. The Holy Spirit hovers upon the faces of the deep. What have you put in the deep? So you are in a profession, you don't read, you don't... These days it's so easy to read, it's so easy to keep up, keep abreast. How many of you have podcast channels that they, your, the, the, the job you are doing, people are discussing constant progress? And they're there, every profession has it now. Blogs, you have things, a lot of resources on YouTube and places like that where you can just study. You see, there is no profession now that is not requiring an interpretation of dream. And there is no level that you can be now that you don't have a potential to go up. Hallelujah. I say you have a potential to go up. Don't run away from challenges. I've preached this many times. When you pray, Lord, promote me, increase me, advance me, what he brings your way is a challenge. Because that is what the world needs to be solved for you to move to the next thing. Just like it was in the days of Pharaoh and Joseph. From today, may God, we are going to do a whole series on courage very shortly, but from today I pray that may God make you bold to dare challenges by the Spirit of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. When they present themselves, they are presenting themselves because God is about to unlock a door of progress for you. And I pray God will help you to go through it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Then number two, he walked by the spirit of understanding. Let's go to back to Genesis 41, verse 31. Verse 31 to verse 32. It says, so the plenty will not be known in the land because of the famine following it will be severe. The plenty will not be known because the famine following it will be severe. Verse, 33, uh, verse 32. He said, and the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because... The thing is established by God. He had understanding. First Chronicles 12, 32 says that the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times. He had understanding. You need understanding now, even with parenting. You want to, you want to raise your 10-year-old child the way you were raised as a 10-year-old? You're going to crash before you start. You are dealing with a different kind of species of human beings. <laughs> They only look like you. They are very different from you. They are transformed. Their generation is far from yours. You need understanding to know what's in their mind. You need to read and understand what they are called generation alphas, as they are called now. You need to understand. There is a lot of research that has gone on to study the patterns of these generations. And I've been doing my own study as well. And I'm going to still find some time to do some teachings around it. However, but the truth is, you need understanding. He said you got the dream twice because it is established. Friends, have you seen yourself in the next five years? Do you have understanding of the workings of the system you are in? To be able to see where things are going in five years' time, ten years' time. I sat my team manager down uh, two weeks ago and I said to her, we have a lot we are doing in my work, the work I do at the University of Brighton. And uh, we have a lot we're doing right now and all that. And I said to her, I need to speak to you because she manages directly the team that, I, I, that, that work with me. I, I said to her, I said, we need to start thinking ahead. She said, okay, what does that mean? I said, in the next five years, this is what is going to be happening. These kind of programs will be like this. They'll be like this. So we need to start training from now. She said, David, this is heavy stuff for me. I said, I know. <laughs> I said, but that's where we're going. So we better start now. In January 2018, I called the brethren in this church at that time. I said, we're going to start operating on Zoom for some services. Some people say, what is Zoom? I say, just come and listen. <laughs> we started praying online and started doing services online because I could see that the world, I could see clearly. I didn't know that there was pandemic coming. I didn't, nobody knew in January 2018 that coronavirus was just about to hit the world to change everything. But when the spirit of understanding is at work, you see a landscape. You see a landscape that is not common to others to see. Some pastors looked at me that time and said, these which kind of unserious people are these you meet online? All of them are meeting online now <laughs> in many ways. 
I just saw that we're a generation that is so busy. Even me, myself, at times you see me here like this today. This time tomorrow I could be in Germany. I could be in Dubai. I could be in Nigeria. I could be anywhere. That's been my life for 20 years. So I saw that that trend is not going to stop. We have people who walk afternoon. Some walk day. Some walk night. Some walk all. <laughs> so how do you do church like that? Then I started to see that no. There must be aspects of virtual. We can never stop koinonia fellowship, physical face-to-face -face gathering, because there is a place where I handshake you. There is a place where I hug you, you hug me. There is a place where we see each other physically that no machine at this point in time <laughs> can replicate. <laughs> because very soon we'll be wearing helmets and things that <laughs> will be in cyberspace. I say, bro, Fulani, how are you? Tap my hand. <laughs> And he will be in Kentucky. <laughs> he will say, Pastor, I'm fine. Pa. <laughs> it's going to come. It's going to come. It's just a matter of time. If you are my age, we were watching Space 1999 in 1978-79 as kids. And we see people use mobile phones. And we were like, this is an impossibility. <laughs> Because even landlines then, you could, not, you could hardly see one. Telephone was still like a wonder to many of us. But some people saw. And look at that. Mobile phones today are obsolete because smartphones have taken over. Artificial intelligence is taking over our world. Friends, go and read about it. Don't say it doesn't concern my work. It will take over your work very soon. AI is coming and is, is here and it's going to come stronger. Whatever your job, you must start to educate yourself about AI because there is no way it's not going to impact on jobs in five years. It's going to change a lot of things. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm telling you things we don't talk about in church. Things that we don't let God pray to open our minds to see. Things are not going to be the same. They are not going to be the same. Cars are going to be driving themselves. I don't know when, but it will happen. Jesus starting to come. So if you are a bus driver and you are so confident, I don't think there's any bus driver in this place, but if you're online, you're a bus driver, you are saying, this my job is secure. Please go and think very well. Very soon you'll be a passenger to a, a driverless bus. <laughs> go and think very well. You are a manager, you are managing people. Now there are software that can organize people's diaries and organize meetings automatically. So you're a secretary and all you do is you upload people's meetings. Go and think, what should I start to train? It's going to affect everybody. Everybody. Enjoy wherever position you are now while it lasts. Very soon, and this one I'm saying very carefully because I know I'll be shut down by church people. Very soon, AI will be used for Bible study. Say, I said it today. It will be used for Bible study. You say, oh, Brother Dave, how? Machine preached to us? No. We will just tell it to generate for us a topic on marriage. And it will give you a long testing and start to speak to you. Then you will start to critique it. That is the way we are going now. Because do you know the way it works? It gathers all the information of what everybody has said everywhere in a very short time and makes sequence out of it. So you can actually use something like that to stimulate your mind further. You need to clap for me. That one is a big bonus. So if you come into church one day and then you just see that there's nobody standing here and I say, we're about to have the message now. Don't say, ah, pastor, which one is this? It just means we have moved into a new scientific world that will help us to engage with the power of technology today and yet understand the scriptures the more. We should never be afraid of technology. Our forefathers were afraid of television. Some of you don't know this. The, my parents' age, they were afraid of television. They say it's the devil's box. <laughs> let's not be afraid of technology God makes technology available so that the gospel can be preached some more today we are reaching the world very easily on the internet we could not do that 30 years ago we had to subscribe to satellite channels they were very expensive now almost any church in fact any human being can reach anywhere now as they want if they have the message it will go further Joseph operated by the spirit of understanding. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind. Lean not on your what? Own understanding. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Don't lean on your own understanding because your understanding and my understanding is limited. I have just given you an example of something that is impacting our world already. Now, unbelievers and people who don't know God at all 
are engaging with it much more. If I ask church people, have you ever heard about AI? You say, AI, is that I in the Bible or which one is AI? <laughs> that is what they will remember. But you know what? We need to know about those things. We are engaging with programs like the Commonwealth Fellowship and things, not because we don't have work to do, but because it will keep us at the forefront of topical discussions and things that are impacting the world and changing and transforming systems everywhere so that our message will not be parallel. Those are some of the mistakes our fathers made. Their messages were sound doctrinally, but they were so devolved and di they, they were so uh, uh, divorced and detached. That's the word, detached from the world around them. So before they knew it, they were wondering, what are we, why is this message not happening the way we expect it to happen? We need that knowledge altogether. And God will give, give us the wisdom in the mighty name of Jesus. The third thing with Joseph is that he operated by the spirit of wisdom and counsel. He operated by the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, and we can see the spirit of wisdom and counsel in him. He said, now therefore let Pharaoh, verse 33, select a discerning and wise man, set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. Verse 35. He said, and let them gather all the food of those good years. Someone say wisdom and counsel. So he had understanding that this is established by God. He had wisdom to know that there needs to be a system in place to manage it. And then he gave the counsel. You see, that point of giving the counsel is the point of liberation. Many believers know they understand, but when the opportunity comes to give the counsel, they shy away. They say, who am I? They say, I'm too small. Nobody will listen to me. But the world, like Pharaoh, is looking for that man who will give the counsel. He said, let them gather all the food of the good years that are coming and store up the grain. Verse 36, he said, then that food shall be a reserve. Look at all the things that God taught him in that one dream. Administration. Economics, finance, everything that people would need to go. This is why I say when your mind is intellectually stimulated, you operate differently. The work I do today in higher education institution, it did not, it was not at this time 10 years ago, 2013, nobody knew about it. Those in further education colleges did apprenticeships and they understood it. But those of us in higher education did not know about it. And government brought it in 2015. When it came to our school, our, my former institution, everybody ran away from it because it's very strange and foreign to what we do. And before I knew it, they just met me and said, David, you are going to manage this program for us. Initially, I thought it was punishment. But God has taught me to understand that every challenge that comes your way is what God wants to use to elevate you. And I started to read, pray, read, pray, read, pray, read, pray. I started to be bold. I would tell them, this is what we're going to do. Even though I was learning myself, I will look at what others are doing. I will learn from what I, I, I have read. I put it together. They will ask me, put me in front of 100 people in the school to say, come and uh, train us on this program. <laughs> Meaning that I was also learning the program. And I would stand there for 40 minutes delivering things and another 20 minutes answering questions. The Spirit of God can work on you. I say it can work on you. And you can manifest the spirit of wisdom, understanding, and counsel. And from this day, that will be your story in Jesus' name. It transforms life. Today, by the grace of God, I lead that provision for a whole university. At a level that I never could have imagined I would have been operating just eight years ago. But what if I did not take the bold challenge? What if? Just when I came into the country... Three years into the country, I was just learning about the systems of the country. One day, our dean called me and he said, we have won 2.5 million pound euros as what they used to call that time the European Social Fund. And we have to deliver training to managers of construction in small companies across the Midlands in two years. He said, all the members of staff don't know what to do and we have to do it. He said, David... Can you do this? I know you have some experience in engineering. That time, I needed the money. So I didn't even think twice to say I, would, I can do it. I said I would do it. <laughs> I needed the money seriously. I had a young family, five people to feed. 
So anything to bring in money, then I bring it along. I will do it. So I said to him, I'll do it. He said, when I left his office, I said to myself, what have I just accepted to do? <laughs> Managers, not ordinary staff. Everything started to come to reality for me. Managers, experienced people, business owners. Ah, what am I going to teach them? So I said, Lord, help me. Give me wisdom. The first day I walked into the class, all of them, of course, they were even older than me in many cases. All of them looked at me like, what's this one going to teach us? <laughs> so I looked at them. Thank God I had already finished my PhD then. I just finished PhD. So I've looked at all their profile. Nobody has PhD there. So I said, I'm doctor, 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 David. <laughs> that doctor came out about three times, I think. <laughs> Before you harass me, I will harass you. <laughs> And then I said, I've practiced internationally. Many of them have not practiced beyond West Midlands. If you work in Nigeria, is that not international? <laughs> you are the one commonizing it. I said, I've practiced internationally for the past 12 years. I've supervised projects worth, and it's true, worth over $120 million. I know many of them haven't done this like that. So that calmed the class down a bit. So when we started, I now noticed that as I was talking, they were giving me examples by themselves. Huh? When they are giving the example, I started writing it down because I did not have any example before. So I'll write this one down. When the other one is talking, I'll say, then I'll say, you two, what do you think? He said, that one will start, I'll start writing it down. So by the time I managed to finish that first group and God gave wisdom, we left. I now saw that these people can do the teaching by themselves. So when they come in, I will just introduce, I was teaching them CDM regulations, we call it, just a set of laws to manage health and safety. So I'll just teach them the context of the law, and I'll say, you, Matt, tell us what you did. You said you worked on H uh, <laughs> um, what do you call this, M6 toll project. He said, yeah, 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 tell us what you did. That one we start. We did this, set it up like this, do that, 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 that. Then I will say, is that not comparable to what you did at Heathrow? I'll call the other one, that one too will start. That is how we spend three hours. They will talk among themselves, talk among themselves, I get paid after three hours. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. You want to be a Joseph that will get to the throne, you will face challenges. When the, when the, the spirit of God is stimulating your intellect, it will not just be about wisdom of the subject matter. It will be something about context and how you can overcome the challenge. You see, at the end of the day, it is a solution that is needed. So however God will help you to get the solution, you will walk by the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of counsel in the name of Jesus. Amen. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, it says, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. Never let these things depart from you. The Bible says, and then, verse 37, Genesis 41, verse 37, the Bible says, so the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh. And he eventually asked in verse 38, he said, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the spirit of God is? That question is what links people to opportunities. The world is looking for solutions. Whether that country is called... Ethiopia, whether it's called South Africa, called Nigeria, called United Kingdom, United States, Canada, Australia, Ghana, it doesn't matter. Solutions, solutions, solutions. So Christians must understand that we carry two solutions. One, for the world to know about the Christ that is at work in us. The hope of mankind is the biggest solution that we have to give to people. The hopeless world needs it. We must not shy from it. But part of the solutions that God is wanting us to manifest is the day-to-day -day problems that the world is facing. Let us not shy away anymore. Joseph did not shy away. We should not. The same God that was at work in Joseph is at work in you and I. And your life will never remain the same again. In the mighty name of Jesus. Rise to your feet and listen. Well,